Welcome back. Today we're going to continue with the really the natural extension of what we talked about in the anatomy of the heart, the cardiovascular system, and begin to look at the vessels as they go from the heart to the rest of the body. First, let's look back at the expansion of the slide I originally showed you of the cardiovascular system. Here we have the heart in the middle, and we have the pulmonary circulation that I showed you last time, the separate circulation from the rest of the body. And then we have the systemic circulation going out the aorta, some of it going up to the head and the brain, a full 20% of it goes out to the head and the brain. And then the rest of the body. Now before, I showed you the body as one big unit, and here this slide has broken it down into different units, which we'll discuss. There's basically several circulations in the body. We've talked about the systemic circulation going to the organs of the body, and we've talked about the pulmonary circulation. There's also a circulation down here on this slide, which shows the venous return from this schematic of the intestinal organs all going back through the liver, where we'll see something called the portal circulation, where we actually go from veins to veins, not from arteries to veins, in an attempt to conserve some of the chemicals and not dilute them. We have another one of those portal circulations in the brain, a very small microcirculation. So there's actually four kinds of circulation in the body. And again, by way of review, remember that the arteries are moving away from the heart and the biggest bulk of those is taking oxygenated blood, carrying it to the body and to be exchanged with the cells and returning deoxygenated blood. The exception, as we mentioned, is the pulmonary circulation where we show deoxygenated blood that has been returned from the right heart and brought out to the lungs, and then the veins are carrying oxygenated blood back to the left side of the heart. Again, remember, in all our conversations, we're talking about the right and the left heart, not the right and the left parts of the body. Always the circulations of that part of the heart. So when we get out and talk about just the circulation itself, we're going to be talking about two vast networks, the systemic, the pulmonary circulation. And what happens in these systems, these are closed loop systems that connect with each other. The um, heart is the pump at the center. And the arteries at first can be looked at just as conduits. They carry the blood away and no exchange goes on in those arteries. And then what happens is each of them divides and branches, divides and branches, and we have really what's essentially different streets. We then move to, um, to look at the streets themselves. And if you look at the next slide, here's a nice overview, somewhat schematic, but still anatomically correct. We look at the arterial side of this circulation. What we see is the aorta leaves the heart and makes a big looping turn down toward the body. And this is called the aortic arch. And it was thought that the aorta actually held the heart up like a shower head. It, it actually doesn't. The heart has its own integrity held in the pericardium. And it begins to immediately give off branches, as you can see here. Now, what happens is all the branches of the body are going to be named primarily for the place they supply. They are going to be um, e either a supply designation or a neighborhood designation. You know there are streets that sometimes change their name without ever changing the street, just by where they go through another neighborhood. In the body, if you look at this slide, we have a trunk coming out of the aorta, there's a division immediately after it leaves, and this trunk is called the brachiocephalic trunk. This means arm and head. Brachio means arm, cephalic means head. As soon as it gives off its branch to the head, which is the carotid artery, and we'll talk about that in detail later, um, it should in theory become the brachial artery. That would be all that's left. It actually isn't. We then name it for the neighborhood. This part of the artery, this very short segment, goes right under the collarbone. 
which has the uh, name of clavicle, and this is the subclavian artery because it's under the collarbone. Very easy. It then goes through the armpit, and it, where it becomes the axillary artery because the armpit is called the axilla, and then it becomes the brachial artery in the arm. What happens after that is that it divides at the elbow and it runs along a bone that's called the radius, the place you actually feel for people's pulses very frequently, and it becomes the radial artery, and on the other side, the ulnar artery, because it runs along the ulna bone. So generally, we're going to talk about the supply to the organ, so we have a gastric artery feeding the, um, feeding the stomach, or we're going to talk about the neighborhood. The aorta then travels down through the body, it does very little in the chest. It actually only gives a few branches to the ribs and to the spine. And then when it pierces into the abdomen, it has lots of branches, which we'll talk about in later lectures. I don't want to overwhelm you now with just lots and lots of names, which will have no meaning. We'll talk about the branches as we get to each organ system. And then this very big artery, which, by the way, is about three quarters of an inch in diameter internally. That's the size of a hot dog then divides into two branches and feeds both sides of the pelvis and the legs. What happens in this arterial system is that as it goes on and on, the vessels decrease in size and it's more than just an anatomic decrease in size. It also is a functional change in size because we go from what we call large arteries to medium arteries to small arteries and then down to something called arterioles, and the function changes at the level of the arteriole. The arterioles are the smallest artery you can see with the naked eye. After that, we get into the capillaries, the arterial capillaries. Capillary means hair-like, and these are finer than human hair. You can hold a human hair up to the light and see it. You cannot hold a capillary up to the light. It is microscopic. It measures in the neighborhood of about eight to nine um, uh, microns in diameter and will just pass one red blood cell as it goes along. The um, other side of that is the venous capillary and that is a functional designation. There, as we'll see, is no real anatomic change as we go from the arterial side to the venous side, but now the, the um, red cells have lost their oxygen and they're on their way back and so that defines the venous side of this system. Let me show you the uh, venous side as it is compared to the one we've just seen. This is the same picture. And by and large, in most of the body, the names are going to be the same. So that the brachial vein, which is running back toward the heart, is going to be running right alongside and named the same as the brachial artery. There's a subclavian vein next to the subclavian artery. They actually touch each other. Some of them are a little different. We have a very big vein in the neck called the jugular vein, and we have a vein coming up from the legs called the vena cava. That's the equivalent of the aorta going back through the heart. But by and large, this system is something we actually don't even study that hard because the names are the same. They run in pairs along with the arteries, and so it's just a given once you learn the arteries that you'll know the names of the veins. Now, of course, the on the venous side, we're going to be increasing in size all the way back from capillaries to till we get to the heart. In the general circulation, we have to think of the capillaries as being the part of the system that is involved in exchange. This is really the only functioning part of the system. Nothing happens by way of exchange of gases in the arteries, the arterioles, all the way down till we get to the capillaries. They're merely channels. They are conduits or roadways which carry the blood to the place we want them to go. I mentioned before that this is an enormous, enormous system. I would say that probably less than a mile of the grossly visible vessels, um, are, I'm sorry, that the grossly visible vessels constitute less than a mile of length. I mentioned the number 50,000 miles, which astounded everybody, but that's the microscopic bed. These are microscopic vessels laid end to end, which certainly would comprise that enormous number. It's hard to visualize a number like that as an awfully big number, but it's just 
just important to realize it's immense compared to the arteries that we can see. What's interesting about these vessels is that they are a very important part of the total functioning of the vascular system, which I'm going to get to in just a minute. There's one other vessel you ought to know about. It's called the vesa vesorum, the vessels of the vessels. When you look at these big vessels, such as the aorta and the vena cava and um, the carotid, anything that you can see with the naked eye, their linings are completely smooth. They don't have any vessels coming out of them and into the vessel wall. So that the vessel wall, which is a tissue that needs to be nourished, is not getting any blood from the bloodstream itself. So we have vessels that come off at different places and actually nourish the blood vessel wall, which is a metabolically active uh, component and needs nourishing. The um, vesa vesorum are visible. You can see them with the naked eye. And uh, they are, again, another system uh, that we don't pay too much attention to because they are just a given. Nothing much goes wrong with them. They tend to be something that stay in the background doing their job without much attention or disease process. The word artery is interesting. It comes from the words that mean to carry air. The early days, two or three hundred years ago, when we first either illegally and then legally got the ability to, to dissect human bodies, um, a lot of these patients died of bleeding or other disorders, and when they were autopsied, their vessels were empty. So the early anatomists and physiologists thought they carried air, uh, which of course they don't. But um, that name has persisted. The artery walls, which we're going to talk about, are um, all different as you go from the aorta all the way down through the arterioles. They're composed of a certain amount of elastic tissue, which gives them recoil ability. They're also composed of varying amounts of smooth muscle. Smooth muscle, as you remember, is involuntary. You have no control over that with your conscious brain. And what you'll see is we have a huge difference between the muscles that have lots of smooth muscle, I'm sorry, between the arteries that have lots of smooth muscle, and between those that don't. Initially, the first vessels are what we call conducting arteries. They have lots and lots of elastic tissue, and they have more elastic tissue than muscle tissue. The reason for this is they need to provide that recoil. So when the heart pumps and the vessels expand a bit to the higher pressures that we talk about, as it recoils, the pressure is maintained and doesn't drop off to zero the way it might in, for example, a pipe, an inelastic pipe. Um, as you get further along the vessels, we develop more and more smooth muscle until we get down to the point where the uh, smooth muscle is the major component of those vessels because they are not involved so much in just channeling blood to one place, but in shunting blood to different places. The main function of the smaller ones, especially the arterioles, is to get the blood to specific organs at specific times and different times of need. The, um, these are called distributing arteries, and they're generally smaller than the three-quarters of an inch that we have in the bigger arteries. The um, arterial wall is a really complex and interesting structure. If you look at this diagram now, we've gone all the way back down to the arterial. Again, this can be seen with the naked eye with some difficulty. And look how it's wrapped in circular muscles all the way down its course in very high concentration compared to, for example, the aorta, which hardly has any. These muscles can only contract in a circular motion. So when they are stimulated, they're going to tend to narrow the opening of the arteriole. They're going to decrease flow through this vessel. Now, if this band of muscles contracted severely, it would shunt a lot of the blood down this, sm uh, down this uh, smaller arteriole and uh, would get it to the place we want it to go. Instead of all the blood going this way out that arteriole, it would come down into this smaller vessel, 
and then into even smaller ones until we get to something called the capillary, which is the smallest uh, structure we have here. And as you can see, this is drawing is indicating one layer of cells. Each of these is a capillary cell. Um, there's only one of these in thickness on the wall. This you could see through, for example, if you shine light. And there is something called a pre-capillary sphincter. This is a complete encirclement at this point that allows the blood to be completely cut off to any group of capillary. Once the blood is exchanged, we go through on the venous side, and we similarly have some smooth muscle, but very, very little, if you compare it up here to the arteriole. Now, this lumen is important because of the gas exchange. As I said, only one red cell will fit through. That means if you have a cell on this side of the capillary and you have a red blood cell here, you have very little tissue for which it, to go, for which it has to go through to get to the cell. So the oxygen can come out of the, the um, red blood cell, through the wall, and then right into the cell wall for exchange. Every cell in the body lies next to a capillary. Every cell in the body. That's why we have this enormous bed of capillaries. I might mention here that there are several different levels of what we call vascularity. Organs that have a great deal of blood supply versus organs that have very little blood supply. For example, the... Um, Brain has an enormous blood supply. It gets its nutrients, its oxygen, and it also doesn't have any way to store oxygen. It's very, very metabolically active. The, uh, any, any termination of blood supply to the brain is catastrophic in a few minutes. Other organs um, have much less blood supply because they're not turning over. They're not active, such as bone, tendons, joints, have very few capillaries, per unit of tissue, um, and they have less blood supply because they just don't need it. And then finally, you have a couple of organs or systems that don't have any blood supply at all. Those are two, the lens of the eye and the cornea of the eye, which we'll talk about later. But if you think about it, you would not want blood running in front of your lens or your cornea, which would then um, blur your vision or color your vision, certainly those organs actually are metabolically very, very inactive, and they get all their nutrition and growth requirements from what's called diffusion. Um, oxygen can come out of the air and nearby tissues and supply them quite well. There's another term I want to talk to you about, and that's called an anastomosis. The plural is anastomoses. You're going to hear this one a lot. Anastomosis refers to the joining of vessels of similar size supplying the same anatomic area. This is critical in areas, and you've already seen one, and that was in the heart. We have the coronary vessels coming off two sides of the heart, going down the heart muscle and meeting in the back. Not only did they send off capillaries and arterioles to nourish the tissue, but they actually joined so that if one of those vessels became occluded or blocked, then the other one might be able to take over. We have a very rich supply of anastomoses in vital organs by and large. The brain is one, the heart is another, and the brain is very unique, and we'll go over that in great detail. If you look at the kidney, which we will do later, for example, there's only one vessel to the kidney. This is called an end vessel. And when you have an end vessel, you have a very precarious situation because if that gets occluded or blocked, that's the end of that kidney. Now, one should say then, why has evolution done this? Why is this allowed? And the answer is because there are two kidneys. Evolution has given us two organs, two complete organs, each with its own blood supply, and each of which can function by itself. You just need one kidney to survive. Now, on the other side, we have the... Um, venous system, and that again is pretty much parallel. Most of the vessels return the deoxygenated blood back, and the venules receive their blood from the capillaries, empty progressively into larger veins till they get to the heart and the superior vena cava. They are thinner walled, they have less elastic tissue, 
And this has a clinical ramification in that when you get bleeding, people think of arterial bleeding as being really, really serious. Well, the arteries have these muscles. They can actually clamp down and, and help stop bleeding, which we'll go into in detail in physiology. But the veins don't. And when you get a big tear in a vein, either from trauma or in the operating room, those can often be the most difficult to deal with, and people can bleed to death uh, because of that uh, inability of the vein to constrict. Now, below the heart, the veins have valves, which prevent backflow. So as we massage our, our veins with our muscles, um, they are able to push the flow back to the heart, and get it into the larger and larger veins without having gravity destroy the effect. So if you have the situation here where this, this is a representation of a vein going through skeletal muscles, for example, your calf, and here are the valves. When the va muscles are relaxed and gravity would tend to pull blood back down toward the feet in the reverse direction, the valves close and prevent any retrograde flow. When the muscles are contracted, they squeeze the blood up. They can't, this blood cannot go backward still, and the blood can go upward back toward the heart the way it goes. This can actually become a problem uh, when you think about it if there is prolonged inactivity or failure of the muscularity to contract. Uh, patients or people, for example, who are on an airplane for long periods of time, sit with their legs hanging down, may not get up, and the blood will pool in these vessels. And blood that isn't flowing, blood that isn't constantly moving, has a tendency to clot. And you can get a clot in the veins, very common, called thrombophlebitis. And this clot will then become a solid mass. It will block the rest of the flow, since it's like a plug. And then if you look down below, what will happen is the blood below it will stop, and it will clot. Also, the chemistry is such that the blood above it will clot as well. Clots tend to propagate clots. So what happens to that clot? That clot is sitting there. It is now called a thrombus. It has the possibility to break loose. If you then get up and start walking around, start ambulating, um, the pressure from these muscles can force that thrombus up into the circulatory system. Well, what's going to happen at that point, if we remember the um, root, is any lower body thrombus and any brain or upper extremity thrombus is going to get into the circulatory system. Now that it's floating, it's called an embolism or an embolus. Embolus meaning just a floating or circulating thrombus. That thrombus is going to get into the circulatory system and it's going to progressively meet bigger veins no matter which direction it's coming from. So there's going to be nothing to stop it on the venous side. It can then go into the heart still getting to be a bigger vessel. It'll go into the ventricle on the right side, bigger vessel, and then it will be pumped out the very large pulmonary arteries where it's suddenly going to encounter smaller vessels. So when it gets into the lung and it reaches either arterioles or anything smaller, eventually the capillary bed, it's going to stop. And it's going to become lodged there in the lung. That's a pulmonary embolism that occurs from thrombo phlebitis of the leg. It used to happen very commonly when we, in the beginning of the last century, patients were kept in bed after surgery for a week. We were very afraid of moving them around, of having our, our repairs tear open, so they were kept flat in bed for a week. Their legs were kept flat and inactive for a week, and they would develop um, these clots in their legs that were probably asymptomatic in many cases. At the end of a week, we'd take them out of bed, drag them out of bed, and help them to walk, and the first thing that happened, they take three or four steps, and they go, ugh, have terrible chest pain, turn blue, fall over, occasionally dead. Sometimes, if it were a small clot, then they might get away with it, because this area in the lung, whatever area that thrombus lands on, is going to die. Its blood supply has been cut off. 
there's no collateral circulation, no anastomoses. So it will depend if the clot is huge and just lands right here in this enormous vessel, it's going to knock off the whole heart. I'm sorry, knock off the whole lung. Um, if it lands in a smaller vessel, it's going to knock off a smaller area. In any case, the patient will have chest pain, shortness of breath, may cough up some blood, and then will either survive or need to go to the operating room to have it removed. I was, uh, when I was an intern, I was sitting in the emergency room, and a, the elevated doors opened, and a big six-foot-four strapping young man took one step through and fell over on his face, turned quite blue. And we raced him to the operating room, actually bumped a cardiopulmonary bypass patient who was just about to go on the table, put this young man on the table, opened his chest, and took out a huge, what's called a saddle embolus. If we go back to this picture, it had landed right here and saddled both sides of his lungs. So he shut off the blood supply to both lungs pulled out this enormous clot that you could hold in your hands and restored the blood supply to his lungs without damage to his lungs or brain. And um, if that had happened in the parking lot, he would have been dead. He just happened to be lucky enough to walk into the emergency room when this, this happened. And he was found to have some clots in his legs that had caused this. What happens if it occurs on the arterial side? If we go over to this side of the heart, on the right, uh, sorry, the left side of the heart, Remember we talked about disorders like atrial fibrillation, when the atrium are not contracting the way they should. Well, if this is just wiggling around and not pumping blood, it makes a nice setup for stasis, blood pooling in at least a little part of the atrium. And that blood can clot. And every now and then with these patients, they're put on a medication or given electro stimulation or just by accident, the atrium will pick up and start to beat again. Now that's a bad thing with the patient who has a clot in there because the atrium will then push the clot out into the ventricle. The ventricle will push it out into the body and where will that clot go? That clot's going to go to the arterial side and it will go anywhere the blood circulation takes it. 20% of blood will go to the brain. He will have the clot go to the arterial side of his brain and we call that a stroke. He will have the clot possibly go out into the body and then it can go anywhere. We can go to any organ at all. It'll tend to go where there's the most blood supply. It can't get to the lungs from that side, can it? Because it's already gone past and it will meet a capillary bed to stop it before it gets to the venous side. There are people who have holes between the two sides of their heart as congenital defects and that patient could have the blood clot go across to the venous side and end up in the lung. Now that you understand the difference between the two circulations, you can see almost where these are going to go without looking at an anatomy book. You can figure out what's going to happen to these. And depending on where this clot goes, it will depend on the seriousness of the disorder. If you have an arterial embolism that goes to your leg, that usually gives you lots of time. The patient will start limping. Um, might have terrible pain in the leg, but the leg muscles actually have a long period that they can go without blood supply and oxygen. So that patient could get to the hospital, could be operated on, have the clot removed. If it went to the intestines, it'd be terrible abdominal pain. It's very, very serious disorder, sometimes very hard to diagnose. And those patients often end up having parts of their intestine removed if you can't get the clot out. The problem with those, unlike the brain, is the matter of diagnosis. How do we know who has this disorder? The um, circulation, um, once we get to the capillary bed now, becomes very physiologic, more than anatomic. I've told you about the uh, exchange of gases, and we've talked about shunting. The shunting is the part I want to concentrate on for just a minute because the shunting is extremely important. We have a capillary bed, this 50 some odd thousand miles of capillaries, which is much larger than the total tank that the body holds. If we think of the whole pool of blood in a vessel, the capillary bed is much, much bigger than our body has blood. So if all the capillaries were opened at one time, 
there'd be not enough blood volume to fill the tank and we couldn't maintain our pressure. No matter how hard you pumped, you'd be pumping into an empty vessel, an empty barrel. And until you could pump it and fill the barrel, you couldn't create any pressure. There's no pressure on the surface of water in a partially filled steel cylinder until you get that cylinder full and then pump some more. So this is purposeful design. Uh, again, evolution has found that it could use the capillary systems to get blood to certain areas of the body where it was needed. Now, this presents a bear trap for us in, who treat patients. For example, if you take a very elderly patient who has decreased blood volume, that patient's either dehydrated or has bled, maybe a, an intestinal ulcer, stomach duodenal ulcer where we don't know how much they're bleeding. They've come in with blood in the stool, maybe a black tarry stool, um, or some other loss. We don't know the volume. We're going to get a very quick appraisal of that volume by the patient's pulse and blood pressure. An elderly patient, as you remember, doesn't have the ability to raise the heart rate as much as a young, healthy person. That patient's heart rate is going to go up as much as it can to try to maintain the pressure head uh, in this now partially empty tank. They're going to try to constrict the vessels, but the elderly, again, just don't have the strength in the muscles of the vessels to give it that kind of support. That patient isn't going to be a big problem. The patient's going to wheel into the emergency room. We're going to start a bunch of IVs, pump blood in, give them fluid, restore the volume quickly, and support their cardiovascular system artificially. We're not going to have any problem with that patient. The trap is the patient who's really young and healthy. The first of these we learned about in World War II, in Korea, in Vietnam, and in the Gulf. When we really understood the physiology at that point as opposed to a century earlier in the Civil War, we realized and we now recognize and have to keep constantly in mind that the young healthy person is going to be able to support the blood pressure even when they have a very low tank. So we empty this capillary bed of blood out onto the battlefield and the medics bring the patient back to the aid station and we know he's bleeding. And we look at the patient, they look fine. Blood pressure is 120 over 80, which is normal. Their pulse may be elevated a little bit from the excitement and the pain, but they don't look bad at all. And if you tend to believe that lie, then you're gonna get this, this young patient in trouble because what's happened to this patient is with their wound, with their blood loss, and the tight ability to constrict their uh, capillary bed, they have an enormous power to just sh start shutting down capillaries everywhere. And they can support their pressure. They also have a very strong heart that can increase to some extent the power of their contraction. And they can also use their own body chemicals to whip the heart to higher rates. A young man could get up to 200 beats per minute, whereas the elderly might maybe make 140 if they were lucky. So that young man is going to sit there in bed look, talking to you and looking fine, and one minute later will be dead of a cardiac arrest. Because when he finally gets to that tiny, tiny place where he tips over the edge and the body can't support it, the last capillary beds are emptied and he can no longer constrict, then the bottom falls out. Now what happens is this patient has a cardiac arrest. Think about our picture again. Where's all the blood? The whole capillary bed opened up and all the blood is pooled down in here. What's returning to the heart? Almost nothing. We start pumping on that patient's chest. We're pumping on, it may as well be air. It's not going to be air because there's no hole in the system, hopefully, but it's going to be empty. It's a, a maxim among trauma surgeons and, and the people who take care of these patients is that if a patient arrests because of what we call hypovolemia or low volume, you're not going to get them back. And that's why the first thing that happens when they come into the emergency room is there are people there sticking IVs in every vein they can get them into. So that immediately we're reestablishing volume ahead of the game until we can determine what's wrong with the patient. We need these lines to get them in. And also remember when your pressure collapses, the venous side collapses and you may not be able to find veins easily to get 
IV lines into. So this is a big bear trap, and these patients don't do very well at all. There's another situation which is more physiologic, less traumatic, and that happens in surgery. And unfortunately, we've all seen it happen. A patient will come in with some hidden source of bleeding or a very visible source of bleeding. And that can be either bleeding whole blood out of vessel from trauma. It could also be loss of fluids, as in something like cholera, where there's massive diarrhea, the whole fluid volume is lost. What happens to that patient? They'll come in and have a very contracted blood volume. Again, the young, healthy male. And um, the blood may be hidden or not hidden at all, but the people who attend the patient want to stop the bleeding. Now, if it's dehydration, it's not an issue because we'll just put in an IV, pump up the patient full of liquids, fluids, and not be thinking about surgery. But we surgeons want to go to the operating room and fix what's wrong, and we like to do it quickly, and we have to be very careful. We have to watch our own enthusiasm for, for getting patients fixed. If you take that same GI now, he's come back from the battlefield or from a car accident in civilian life, He's bled, and his blood pressure keeps dropping, and you see that you're not getting ahead. You think there's bleeding you would like to stop, and you think, well, if I can only stop that bleeding, we'd be fine. You race the patient to the operating room, and anesthesia puts him to sleep. The patient's had a nice blood pressure pulse. You're doing well, and as soon as he goes to sleep, his blood pressure drops out the bottom, and he dies on the table. What's happened is the very same thing. His vessels have been tightly constricted to stop flow to the capillary beds so that this patient can maintain the pressure. When you put the patient to sleep, you do what the body did in the shock in the old patient. You immediately relax all his muscles, including his smooth muscles. So not only does his body relax in terms of skeletal muscles, but the smooth muscles relax. You actually block them with a chemical that makes all the capillaries open up. And now all the blood pools in that body again, and he drops his pressure. He has a cardiac arrest, and he's hypovolemic again, low volume. And that patient's going to die on the table. So what we have to do, and, and it certainly is part of the checklist, is we always try to restore the volume before we do anything to these patients. And we're particularly careful, not as much in the elderly, because they tell us what's going on, but in the very young and healthy, who are sitting there really as a trap, um, which can be a very lethal trap. Now, the other thing to remember is that this is a very fine physiology, well-regulated flow goes to the places where it's needed and the body in normal circumstances does a very good job. When you're sitting down and reading a book, a lot of your flow is going to your brain. A lot of the flow may be going to your stomach if you've just had dinner. Very little of it is going to go to your skeletal muscle. When you're out running a marathon, it'd be nice not to have food in your stomach and require blood to go there because you need all the blood shunted away from your stomach into the muscles that are being used to, to pump and to run and to swing your arms. However, um, there are some times when this just doesn't happen. And one of those examples is with the brain. You have a little problem with the brain. The brain will re require the body to give it blood no matter what. Now, the brain is part of the organ system that's going to regulate the nervous impulse that opens and closes sphincters, that allows blood to be shunted here and there. And the brain just says no to no blood. And that can happen at the expense of other organs. It will shut down virtually every organ except the heart to get blood. If, if this is at the expense of your kidneys, so be it. The brain takes over first. Now, it can't shut down the heart because the coronary vessels are the first vessels that come off the aorta. So the heart will feed itself, as we said, but the brain will shut down everywhere else if there is a problem. The um, other area where this is a problem can be in patients uh, who have abnormal shunting from one side to the other. Usually there's a very even distribution of blood flow in the arterial side and on the venous side. There's actually about 60% of the blood on the venous side, 
which is moving very slowly, and then the arterial side catching up with it, and it stays very well balanced. There are some things called arterial venous fistulas. And in an arterial venous fistula, you have a large vessel opening up from one side to the other and skipping sides. Let's go back to this drawing. If you can imagine that this vessel that was coming here into this organ didn't go through its capillaries but jumped across and went into the venous side. An arterial venous fistula then bypasses the capillary bed. Now, this is a very high-pressure system. So the blood is not going to have the opportunity to be forced through the capillaries, and it's going to be stolen from the capillary bed. What happens to these patients is you have a very fast circulation through the system, skipping the capillary beds. It's a steal from one side to the other. And those patients have to have a higher output, cardiac output, to also feed the capillary beds. The patient is going to need to have more circulation than it was meant to have. Patients with arterial venous fistulas um, can go into heart failure, especially if they're elderly. If it's chronic and they're elderly and it's high flow, those patients can go into failure because their heart is just being asked to do more than it can do at any one time. We create fistulas sometimes intentionally, and I'll talk about that more when we get into the kidneys and other organs. I haven't talked to you yet about what's called portal circulation. All the models that I've shown you so far have had the blood flowing from the arterial side into an arterial capillary bed, and then going across the arterial capillary bed onto the venous side. Here, for example, we're looking at it in the lower extremities in the legs. There is a different system called the portal circulation. And this is where one venous system at the capillary level, not at a fistula level, joins with another venous system rather than arterial to venous capillaries. The major one of these is through the liver. If you look at this slide, blood coming from a very specific set of organs. These are all the digestive organs, and it starts really, although not shown here, at the esophagus, which is your first digestive system organ, we'll talk about later, and then the stomach. And this schematic is showing us the celiac trunk. And um, this is showing it all these vessels coming back through another funny system. Here's the vena cava on this side. This is the big one. But we have a different system that is entirely related to one kind of function, and that is digestion. If we look at this slide, and this is a, a drawing, but it's very, very detailed and accurate. Most of the blood comes back from the body and goes through this big vein, which is shown cut off. It doesn't show the whole vein. This is the vena cava. The inferior vena cava goes through the liver, without giving branches to it. It doesn't have much circulation with the liver. This other situation of vessels is called the portal system. All the vessels that feed the intestinal tract or that drain them coming off the venous side. For example, this is the rectum, the colon, which is cut away here, and then the stomach, the spleen, which is attached actually to the stomach, and the pancreas, which is nestled in here, all have vessels that join together. This is the superior mesenteric, uh, which we'll, I'll show you in more detail. And a splenic vessel, they join and they meet a big fat vein here that's next to the vena cava but not attached. It's called the portal vein. It goes into the liver, and then what it does, those capillaries... Uh, divide. This vein doesn't get bigger and bigger the way veins did up until that point. It gets in the liver and it gets smaller again, becoming venous capillaries. It surrounds the cells of the liver. It joins on the other side with venous capillaries again and then exits into the vena cava to join the rest of the circulation. Why? So that we can get the nutrients out of the blood and let them be acted upon by the liver. 
detoxified, absorbed, broken down, whatever. This portal circulation is very efficient modification of the normal circulation and allows us to extract the maximum from it. And it's very different. We'll talk about it a lot when we get to the liver. We have a similar one on the other side in the brain. We'll talk about that at the same time. And when we return, we'll move on now to the physiology of the circulatory system and the blood.